tonight we have special guests from Hawaii, uh, Dr. Brett Taylor, and he got his uh, master's at UOG, and got his PhD at James Cook, right? Mm -hmm. University, and he just started working at the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center in Honolulu, colleague of mine, and he's going to talk tonight about parrotfish that were part, part of his dissertation work. Welcome, Brett. Yeah, thanks a lot. And th I want to acknowledge Mike. He's the one who invited me to come out, so I really appreciate everybody having me. And uh, it's really neat to get an opportunity to present this work here, um, and especially here, because this is what I'm actually going to present is not just a part. It, it basically is the gist of my entire Ph.D. work that I did. Started it at the University of Guam, and I was based at, the, uh, at James Cook University in Australia. Um, but, I mean, this is all work throughout Micronesia, if you can't tell by the, uh, the first, uh, first word in the, uh, in the title. But um, I call this Micronesian parrotfishes as a model group um, because really it's not just about parrotfishes. And, I, and I, I make that point because parrotfishes have become quite trendy. Um, this, is, this is a couple of news articles that came out in the media in the middle of last year. Um, can anybody hear me first of all? Okay, I meant to say it at the beginning. So this, is, this is a couple of news articles that came out in July of last year, and they got a lot of media attention, specifically and mostly from Caribbean species, because it was about a report that came out by a world-famous scientist, Jeremy Jackson, from the Caribbean, the state of the Caribbean coral reefs. So parrotfish has really emerged in the media around that time, but it's not just brand new. I mean, for the last few years, well, first of all, I should point out that for a long time, parrotfishes have been a, a topic of study. Um, in, in coral reef science. They're a ubiquitous species on the reef, or a, a ubiquitous family really on the reef. But in the last few years, there's been an increasing number of scientific studies focused specifically on the effects of fishing on parrotfishes. Um, and that, that was one of the motivations here for me. But stepping back, looking more of an ecological concept here, the core issue is that in recent history, there's been an increasing impact on coral reef fisheries of the Indo-Pacific. This is very well documented. Um, from this, so we know the effects of um, fishing on abundance and biomass, that's all pretty, pretty basic and pretty simple. You know? We can go a lot further than that nowadays. So there's a general consensus flowing on from this that such disturbances, which is taking fish out of the water, may have flow-on effects regarding now the demographic processes. So I'm talking about more intricate things that are difficult, more difficult to measure, like life histories of species, um, across species, within species, etc. So some underlying themes that, that are going to be pervasive throughout this talk um, three of them, actually, and the first is, is looking at the variation in life history traits, now both between species, so when we have a suite of a bunch of different species, trying to, um, trying to categorize these species into different groups and, and understand the variation in them based on their life history traits, and then within species. So you take one single species, and, and as you go across space, its, it's life history traits are going to change, and so why is that? And what does that have to do with management? And specifically, what do these things have to do with vulnerability? What, what effect do they have on vulnerability to over-exploitation? Um, the second thing is the influence of spatial scale on demographic processes. And now, I point out spatial scale because coral reefs themselves are extremely, extremely patchy environments. And, and, and think about it in terms of Micronesia. I mean, when you zoom out and you're looking at all of Micronesia, it's just a million little, not a million, but many thousand little dots in the ocean. You know? I mean, they're much more complex than that. But at that scale, we're looking at a bunch of little tiny dots that are extremely biodiverse areas. And then beyond, that, beyond the realm of that dot, it becomes a very vast you know, nothingness in the open ocean until you get to the next dot. Um, so, so I say that because coral reefs are really the extreme example of spatial patchiness and biodiversity. The third thing is simply how fishing pressure interacts with these above concepts. Now, if we talk about natural variability, this is what underlies all of this work. Um, and, and I want to really point it out because this is something, this is, a, this is an assumption, or the, thing, the, the simple fact that things differ across space um, is an, an assumption that, or it is, I should say, is something that's completely overlooked in a lot of um, analyses. Um, and, it, and it can be a real problem. But now the things that drive natural variability are, are things like latitude as a proxy for water temperature, habitat, shelf position. This is just a very short list of things affecting fishes on coral reefs. The important point is that they're all very dynamic and interactive, and therefore they're difficult to tease apart kind of in a statistical or quantitative sense. Now, the take-home message from this is that the ecology and biology of any given species is not going to be homogenous across its range. Um, and that brings me back to parrotfishes, and I talk about them as a model group. And they're an incredible group to work on. Um, if you want to ask all kinds of questions going from single species population biology to community ecology, 
because um, there's a high number of very conspicuous species that co-occur in the, in the same habitat. Um, they're, they're sexually dimorphic protogynes, which means they're dimorphic in both body size and coloration. So you can tell the females often from the males because the females are drab and small. The males will be vibrantly colored and large. And that's, that's important because with a lot of species in the sea, we can't just look at them and get that kind of information straight away. Um, they come in a variety of body sizes. They have a lot of different maximum lifespans. This is already documented. The variation that you see in their demography, that's already been documented that you can get a really surprising amount of variation. Um, say, on the, a lot of that work came from the Great Barrier Reef where just across 20, 20 kilometers from the mid-shelf to the outer shelf reef, species were living twice as long, having twice as much mortality in a, in a place. And, um, so they've been documented to have a lot of uh, demographic variability. And then, of course, if we're going to answer any questions about fishing effects, you know, parrot fishes are, are harvested at, at widely ranging levels throughout not just Micronesia, but the entirety of the uh, tropical and subtropical range. So a couple of methods um, pervade throughout the talk as well, and so I'm going to go ahead and put them up here. The first is fishery-independent sampling. So this is the idea that you're collecting fish specimens um, to get life history information. So you're collecting the specimens from the wild. You're getting things like the otoliths. Um, which I don't know if everybody's familiar with this, but otoliths are basically ear bones in the fish. They grow with the fish, uh, or they grow throughout the ontogeny of the fish, and therefore you can take a section just like you can with a tree, um, and it, with dendrochronology what you do is you count the rings and they, they are annual rings. And so that's a, a tool for being able to get age-based information on a population. Um, and then also this is a histological slide of a, of a gonad. Um, so that's, that's a method for, for getting sex information and... Um, or gender information, and then sexual stage, so whether or not the fish is mature. So that gives me the life history side of everything, and now I need to know what's actually out in the environment, and so that's why I use stereo video technology. And this is, this is quite a, quite a you know, fun way to go about it, but the reality is all I was trying to do was visual surveys of, of, of parrot fishes. Um, so I could have also used just the standard visual survey technique where I'm swimming down a transect and recording what I see and estimating its size. There are advantages and disadvantages of this method. The advantage that I really wanted to take advantage of, no pun intended there, um, is that you get extremely, since you, you're, you've got two big large bug eyes, you've got, you've got two reference points, you're able to triangulate that in software when you're analyzing these videos. You can measure fish as you see here on the screen, um, and what you end up with is, is extremely precise estimates of the length. Um, so this is a, obviously a good example, I'm not going to show you a bad one, but this is, the, this is a 200 and 240-something uh, centimeter fish, can't see it for the pix pixels, or millimeter fish, and the precision on that estimate is just barely over one millimeter. Um, so the, the downside of using this method, it's really labor intensive. Because you know, when, you're, when you're just counting fish, you walk out of the water and you have your data on your data sheet. With this, you have to go back and spend hours at, um, processing the video. So I wouldn't recommend the method unless you have a need for that really precise length estimate. Estimates. So I've got four objectives throughout this, and I'm, as I kind of alluded to before, I'm going to work from uh, single species population bi biology in one area, and then move towards um, looking at things on different spatial scales, and then looking at whole, whole communities on different spatial scales. So the first objective I call comparative demography. It's a very simple but, but time-consuming task where I wanted to get a demographic picture of a parrotfish assemblage on a, on a single contiguous reef. So the reef I'm studying in this, in this part is Guam specifically, and I've got 12 different parrotfish species that I've sampled, and there's about 20, 20, over 20 species of parrotfish that you find on Guam and here throughout the Marianas, um, but these 12 on Guam represent 98% uh, of the parrotfish biomass that you find on the outer reef slopes of Guam. So in effect, um, I'm characterizing pretty much the entire uh, demographic picture of parrotfishes on Guam. And so with fishery independent sampling, I collected um, information on seven different traits. Four of them were length, what I call length-based traits. So it's things like the mean maximum length for each species, um, the length at female maturity, length at sex change, and a growth rate proxy, and then three age-based traits. So that's age, age at female maturity, the mean maximum lifespan, and then the rate of mortality for each species. This is total mortality. Um, and in general, what you find for the parrotfish is it's very good um, correlations among length-based traits. So when you compare two length-based traits, they're really, really highly correlated. Um, same for age-based traits, but there's a bit, 
there's good correlations between length and age, uh, but that breaks down a bit there. So there's a little bit of a decoupling between length and age-based traits, and that's kind of what you, what you get there. That's comparing um, the, the mean maximum age with the mean maximum length. So I took this, I took this and I'm going to try and, I'm, uh, this is an experiment here, I'm going to try and demonstrate this with some goofy animations um, to show you, I've, I've run a cluster analysis, and what I have done, so this is a statistical basis to where these fish are going to be moving around. What I wanted this to do is um, get an idea of how these fish would group out based specifically on their life history parameters. Um, and I, now I have one a priori knowledge, which is the genetic relatedness of these species, which is depicted here. We have three individuals in the Chlorurus genus, six in the Scarus, and then kind of these, these outgroup species, one in each of the genera, one in each genera. Now, um, what we find is that there's hierarchical structuring to, to how these things partition. So, first of all, as you notice, um, ge genetic relatedness goes out the window, and what you end up with is eight large-bodied species statistically separated from four small-bodied species. That's the first distinction. It's all distinguished based on length-based traits, um, and these are the traits that, that were um, significant. And then, once that distinction is made, what you end up with is, uh, oh, something's lost in translation there, but what you end up with is late maturing large body species and early maturing large bodied species, and then uh, fish with longer lifespans that are smaller bodied species with longer lifespans and lower mortality, and then the converse of that as well. And so beyond these separations, there's nothing else pulled out um, with a statistical model. Um, but the important point there is that is that you're able to distinguish among these species and there's no phylogenetic basis to it at all, which is kind of surprising. It was true for the parrot fishes. It may not be true for other families. It certainly wouldn't be true if you put higher orders of, of, of different reef fishes in there. If we were to throw um, surgeon fishes in, you know, 12 surgeon fishes, I would imagine, um, but I don't know, but I would imagine that they would all separate out based on that first and then further, further delineations would then um, kind of go more like, like what you see here. So I'm moving to the second objective. I now have a demographic picture of a parrotfish community, um, and I want to specifically address this question that we think we really know the answer to, and I wouldn't argue that we don't, but we've really, especially in coral reef species, we've never given it um, a good quantitative assessment, which is how well do the life history traits predict vulnerability to over-exploitation, and which of these traits might be the best predictors. Um, so I've, defined, I've quantified um, life history, now, I, I need to quantify vulnerability to over-exploitation, which isn't a very, very easy thing to do. Um, so I approached this using two different, two different data sets. One was using spatial trends aqu across Guam. So I had 17 sites with surveys of biomass for each species um, across a gradient of fishing pressure. So I've got sites that are in, in marine protected areas. I've got sites that are in kind of um, less often fished areas, and then sites that are in very heavily fished areas, really close to easy access points where a lot of people, especially, um, uh, well, yeah, a lot of, a lot of spearfish will, will go right off the uh, shore. And so the, and I've, take, I've accounted for um, environmental factors that would, would uh, lead individual species to be more or less abundant. Like some species like to be right next to lagoons or channels. Some species like to have an affinity for um, fringing reef systems where the waves are just crashing right into the rocks on the, on the cliff side. Um, so the, the idea is accounting for that, what trend do you get across fishing pressure? Do you get a de decrease in the biomass of the species? Is it just flatline or do you sometimes get an increase? And then the second thing is the same concept but a bit simpler. Just looking at mean harvested length of all the species across, um, across the 20 year data set. So do you see a decline in the mean length um, or, or do, do you not? Is it just flatline? And so these are, don't worry about these, these are, are basically the, the generalized linear model outputs. Um, the important thing is that, what I, and they're just describing the fit of the data to the, to the vulnerability metrics. Um, so the, the important thing to take away is that length-based traits, all traits were pretty good at predicting vulnerability of a species. Length-based traits outperformed age-based traits in general. However, the most important trait to emerge was the age at maturity which explains 76% of the variation in whether or not a species would be considered um, highly or, or not vulnerable to overexploitation. So a simpler way to put that is that if I'm just armed with the information of the age at female maturation for a species, for a parrotfish species, um, three-fourths of the time I'm going to be able to tell you correctly that where, you know, where it would lie on that spectrum. 
So what we see, the results from this, the, age of, the, the importance of age at maturity is quite paramount. And I, I make, this, make this distinction here because age at maturity is the last thing that we estimate in life history studies, especially in coral reef fishes, because it, it, requires, um, it requires the age information and it requires the reproductive information. Um, so you don't find this kind of metric out there a whole lot. Uh, sorry, the, the second thing is um, the, the takeaway message, and I say this tenuously right at this stage, and you'll see why later, um, is that given the range of vulnerabilities, there's, it seems there's quite a high propensity for a structural change to a parrotfish assemblage. Um, so you, you would think there'd be some kind of signature or a, or a fingerprint of fishing pressure on parrotfish assemblages. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind, please, as, we, as I go forward. Um, I kind of went over that. So at this stage, I'm going to the third objective, and I'm going to completely change pace. So I've been talking about single species population biology across a, an assemblage. I now want to focus just on a single species across space. Um, so I'm looking specifically at sex change, but that's basically my proxy for any life history metric, because as you saw before, um, most of them are really well correlated. Um, so when we infer something for sex change, it usually has to do with length of maturity and, and other other uh, traits as well. But the motivation here, I'll back up for a second, There's a, we know quite a tremendous amount about the dynamics of sex changing species on coral reefs. And we owe a lot of that to a guy named Bob Warner, who is the, the, the second author there on this, and this is a book chapter that I pulled this out of. And um, he studied little labrids, little, little wrasses, um, you, things that were quite similar to parrotfishes because they, they're sexually dimorphic, they change sex throughout their lifespan. And um, they, have, they have a really neat little social system. And he did all kinds of experiments with those. Most of the experiments that, in, in this book chapter, they went, on, they went on to review all of that. And they, but one thing he points out is most of these experiments, most of all the knowledge that we, that we have now about this process occurs, or the studies at least, occurred on a spatial scale of about this stage. Um, and sometimes they were tank experiments. So realistically, we're talking about, you know, something the size of this podium. And so they... They review all this in this chapter, and then at the very end, they have a little section called Scaling Up Observations, where they point out that we do not know the extent of geographic variation in reproductive behavior in any coral reef species, and this is centrally relevant for conservation biology and management. And, and this, you know, I, I saw an opportunity to address this with the stereo video stuff. So I had two questions I wanted to, to answer here, and then I'll get into to how I address these. Um, the first is, what is the hierarchical nature of drivers structuring le length at sex change at different spatial scales? So the idea here is, you go across Micronesia to, all, to different islands, and you see the same species, and their population biology changes. Sometimes subtly, sometimes quite drastically. Sometimes you see species that, that or you see individuals that are nearly twice the size of where, of where you're from, say on Saipan, or maybe if you're in Yap, they're twice the size in Saipan. Um, and so the second thing is how does selective pressure, for example, and I mean by selective pressure, I mean fishery selection where larger, larger individuals are being targeted at a greater rate, that versus, say, natural selection where most of the mortality is occurring on the smallest individuals or earlier in the lifespan. How do those, the difference in those, how does that influence the dynamics of sex change? And to address this, I, um, so I'm using the stereo video information. This is where the length information is very important. So in this, in this example here that I'm going to give in this talk, I'm focusing on particularly the one species, the bullethead parrotfish. This is the most common parrotfish throughout the Marianas and throughout the vast majority of the rest of Micronesia. Um, and they're really good to work on because they're, because they're really abundant. You know, if you're doing statistics anytime, sample size doesn't hurt. Um, you can really easily tell the females from the males. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're very drab and brown and then the males get very bright, either you know, blue-green or, or that yellow color that you see there. There is the issue of initial phase primary males, um, and if somebody's interested in that, ask after the talk, but it, it, luckily it, it didn't become an issue at all um, in the way that I was addressing the data. So the idea here is I get all these length measurements for 55 sites across eight islands, and um, I'm able to bin the, uh, bin the frequency of females to males over the different size, over one centimeter size classes, and then estimate really nice, really uh, precise estimates of the length at 50% sex change. So this becomes my response variable, and it's, it's listed here on the x-axis, which is a bit funny, but I'm just trying to show you the variation that you can get um, in length at sex change across just 17 sites on Guam. So right now we're at the within-island scale. We're at a small spatial scale. 
Um, and as you can see, it's quite, quite immense. They're, they're, these guys are changing sex just within this kind of 30, 30 kilometer or 30 mile um, north to south area from 180 millimeters all the way up to about 250 millimeters. And that's a, that's a considerable range across for a species that only gets to about 30, 30 centimeters altogether. So what correlates best with the change that we're seeing across the sites? What, what habitat or exposure or fishing pressure variables um, drive this? And it's all fishing pressure. That's what comes out. Um, what you get is where you have high fishing pressure, you get very low length at sex change. Um, where you get low fishing pressure, you get a very high length at sex change. And so what it, what it demonstrates, or what it seems to infer, is a compensatory mechanism where you're removing the large vibrant males from the population, and what you end up with is, um, is a, uh, an earlier shift in, in from, from female to male. Now, when we address this at the larger scale, this is now going across um, uh, eight island, or actually seven islands in this study, three different island types. I'm just going to point that out quickly. Fringing islands are like Saipan, Guam, uh, Koh Rai. These are, these are large rocks sticking out of the ocean um, with, with mu very much fringing reef around it. Um, atolls need no introduction. They've got a huge empty lagoon. Um, and then barrier reef systems are more like Yap or Ponape, if you're familiar with that. So very complex systems with a large body of, uh, or with a large land mass, but it's set, the land mass is separated from the outer barrier reef um, by, a, by an extensive complex lagoon. So you're kind of increasing in, in complexity, uh, a broad scale complexity from, from left to right. Um, and as you see now, we're now ranging from in the 140s all the way up into the 240s. Um, so the range is even higher. So I would expect, well, well is fishing pressure driving this? Um, and the answer is, the truth is, before I even begin, this species really isn't targeted much at all in any of these other islands. It's tar it's, there's a wide range of pressure on Guam, but on the other islands it's not. And I don't even need to show you this graph because the truth is it's all encapsulated in the little inset graph there. All of the variation, this was the biggest surprise during my PhD, all of the variation in this demographic feature, length at sex change, a very straightforward thing, was coming from, uh, was, was being explained by what type of island you're on, or the island geomorphology, broad scale geomorphology of an island. Um, and, it, and, and so, you know, what's the mechanism? I have no idea right now, but we can explore it a little bit further. So, going back to Bob Warner's work, he showed a lot of really strong correlations between density or sex ratio, these are interrelated factors, um, so this is density as in just the number of, of this species per uh, a given area. Here I'm, I've modeled it for hectare. And then on the y-axis is our length at sex change. Um, the relationships that you see, they're, they're not, um, there's twice as many data points there but, uh, because of the, uh, the screen. But um, basically it's, it's, you know, it's not really a, much of a relationship at all. You might be able to call that a positive relationship. Certainly the sex ratio one is a positive relationship, but it really fans out to the higher values. And this is across all sites in Micronesia. Now, I'm now going to distinguish this by what type of island type you're on. And I'm also, I want to point out as well, I'm also going to delineate Guam from the other fringing reef sites because Guam is really the only place here where, um, where, the, uh, where this small species is, is, has a wide range of fishing pressure, you know, and, and really in just a, several sites. And so when we do this, we find out there actually is really, really strong relationships between these parameters. Um, and still, so the range of density and, the, and, well, not the range of sex ratio everywhere except for Guam um, is basically the same. You know, there's two sites in Guam where you have really high density, but otherwise the trend remains and everything's the same. So it's not density, it's not differences in density across these island types um, that's driving this pattern. You still get a structuring along that y-axis based on what type of island you're on. So I still don't know the mechanism, unfortunately. Um, but I mean, there's, there's lots of theories and hypotheses you can derive from this. It's just be, it would just be very difficult at scale to, to test these. Um, but the interesting thing here, the, the takeaway message, is that you get a positive relationship, positive relationship, positive relationship. But then on Guam, where you have, where, the, the, where there's, a, there's more, I wouldn't say the main mortality for these guys is fishing, but you have more fishing mortality such that you start to see some kind of impacts. Um, you get that change in the relationship. Suddenly it becomes negative. Um, so what does this mean? I'm going to skip, skip forward to this. So that's an interaction term in, in statistical sense, um, but it's not really real. It's, you know, this is an interaction between island type and density, but that doesn't really exist, I don't think, because um, what it is, that's based on the fishing pressure. Um, you know, where we have that wide range of fishing pressure, you get that negative slope, and that implies that 
the selective pressures that exist can really significantly alter the dynamics, the, the, the social dynamics of sex change. So going back to the first point, um, you know, the, the main thing to take away from this is the importance of island geomorphology is, is quite immense. It's, this, is, this was the big surprise I didn't expect. I thought that island geomorphology would have some kind of effect, obviously, but you know, more so on, on um, community structure, not really on something so specific as, as a specific life history trait. Um, but it overrode all the other habitat level effects at the broad spatial scale. Um, but, you know, these, other, these habitat level effects are evident, and I include fishing pressure in that. But um, they're evident at the within the island scale, but they're going to vary. They vary based on you know, what the range of each one is, uh, where you're at. So one thing you see here is a very high adaptive capacity to fishery extraction, but that really only emerges at the within island scale, because there's, there's very, limit, very limited potential to gain inference on that kind of thing across, all the, across multiple islands. So the, the final objective, uh, it came through. Um, the final objective really is to is to build off of that. You know that kind of changed my thinking. I thought, well, maybe maybe island type is a lot more. Not that I ever thought it wasn't an important determinant in reef fish community patterns, but maybe it's even more important than what we see in the literature. Because um, oftentimes you see fishing pressure as the default hypothesis in the li literature. And nobody can be blamed for that, because fishing pressure is the kind of thing that managers can manage. You can't manage what type of island you're on. You know, I mean, you try and imagine that kind of scenario. Um, so the idea here is really following from that, except our response variable is no longer just length of sex change. We're now looking at a multivariate community distribution. Um, so I'm running RDAs and canonical analyses, and it's a bit, if you're not familiar with this, it's, it's, it's difficult to follow. But the, the, the thing I want to point out is each, each dot on that graph there represents one of 55 sites across eight islands in Micronesia. They're color-coded based on the type of island that they're, at, that they're at. We've got one more one more island type here because it's an island type where that species that I was working on exists in very, very low numbers, so I couldn't actually include it in the other one. But that turns out to be a, uh, a defining feature of it as far as in, in multivariate framework. So the thing I want you to take from all the, the scatter of the dots is that the most important, or the most, uh, the strongest determinant here is you can see how there's a loose but very significant cluster of the sites relative to each other based on what type of island type. Um, to the top of the graph, you've got the atoll sites. To the center of the graph, you've got fringing reef sites. Um, down to the bottom, there's barrier reef sites. And then off to the left, along the, along the x-axis, there's, um, uh, there's the low coral sites. And so coral rugosity turns, so that's the combined metric of the coral cover and how rugose the habitat is, um, or how structurally complex, I should say, the habitat is. Um, that turned out to be really important, but it was important only kind of within that island scale. And that's why it's going um, in the opposite direction as the distinction between all the different island types. Um, and so, so that you can, you can tell the differences in, within an island type based on coral and rugosity. But, um, it, you know, it, you don't get much inference on that across these different island types. So what is going on? I mean, it's really not that surprising. Honestly. What we see, the consistent pattern, is as you increase in habitat diversity, and not, not small-scale habitat diversity, this is large island-scale habitat diversity, as we increase in that, we get an increase in species richness, just for the parrotfishes again, to keep it in context, increase in species richness, an increase in biomass weighted phylogenetic diversity, but these things really aren't, aren't surprising. This is the fingerprint um, that really, really sticks at this spatial scale. And so I say, you know, what, what about fishing pressure? Because this is the thing that, that people are interested in, and we have all these really big broad scale generalizations now that you see in, in, in big, you know, important journals out there in the scientific literature. Um, you know, here, when I'm taking this view at it, um, you know, the results are very scale dependent. That's one thing that comes out. You know, what you see is dependent on what scale you're looking at. Um, so it's, you know, but the truth is fishing pressure does have clearly demonstrable impacts. It's just, you know, whether you're looking at the trees or the forest. So it's very um, context dependent and it's emerging at these local scales. So the conclusion there is that there is quite li little evidence of a universal footprint when we're looking at multivariate community structure. And that, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the point that I want to make. Because there's, there's other ways to address the data where you can get other, other ideas. But I'll, I'll address that in a second, on the next, actually on the next slide. Um, but so, yeah, again, we see strong effects within islands or within island types. 
So to summarize all of this in, in kind of one bullet point slide here, going back, the interspecific diversity, interspecific meaning across those 12 species or across any number of species, um, the diversity in life history traits can be a very good predictor of vulnerability to overexploitation. Um, intraspecific demographic variation is very complex, and the, the key thing there is, again, scale dependence. You know, if it's the forest or the trees, whichever way you're looking at it is going to determine what, what emerges as that you know, significant correlate of, of the patterns that you see. So the structuring of parrotfish assemblages at very broad spatial scales is largely dependent on habitat, not so much on fishing. Um, and that's, I go back to that idea of fishing pressure as a default hypothesis. And I, I, I point this out, again, like I said, with the, with the, the idea of, um, of what we can manage. You know, everybody wants to know about fishing pressure um, and, and, you know, get these broad-scale generalizations. But the problem with the broad-scale generalizations, and this is where I take that devil's advocate approach, is, um, you know, they, they're really, really neat. When people get these data sets that span the entirety of the Pacific or the entirety of the tropical oceans, and they, they provide these, these generalizations of, of, you know, what happens. Um, that's a really, really neat, incredible reference point. But those kinds of studies actually have very little utility to resource managers. Um, and the resource managers are the most important users of this kind of information, studies like this or, or any of the others. Um, and, and I would say these resource managers are often working at the scale of a single island. Sometimes when you go into, into uh, the outer islands of Micronesia, they're, they're working at a, the, the, a sing, they're, the scale they're working at is a single stretch of reef. Um, and so when we have these correlations on things like, things like iconic species like Bulba metapon, you know, you might argue, or, or what, those, what those kinds of generalizations would tell a resource manager working at the scale of a reef, is, you know, you walk in and you say, oh, the reason why you don't have X number of bulb metapon per hectare on your reef is because you, because you have too many people or too many of this, too many of that. And that may be right, and it may be completely misconstrued. Um, because, you know, pla places like fringing island systems really don't have the capacity for a species, for large populations of a species like bulb metapon. And, and this is just an example of bulb metapon. There are many, many species out there that we've found out have very, very specific habitat requirements when they recruit as tiny little individuals, water quality um, things, habitat things that all have to be together to get really good recruitment of these species. And the second thing is once they're big iconic adults and swimming in schools, they, ha they also have very, very specific habitat requirements, but now it's at a much broader scale with the types of lagoon, if there's uh, access to lagoons and the connection between lagoons and mangroves and, and other types of habitats. Um, all these things play in. And so that's where I come in and, and uh, you know, the, the major thing to come out of this is I, I wasn't interested in telling another story about what fishing pressure can do on, on broad, small and broad scales, but the thing that really emerged to me was the amazing importance of, of um, the different types of, of islands, it, or the, the relative influence of these different islands, and because that's something that you don't see in the literature. It gets, it gets glossed over quite a bit. And that, I think, is very important to resource managers to, to um, correct for broad-scale generalizations. Um, but that's what I've got for you today. I hope I was on, on good time there with you. But um, I, I want to thank Mike again for inviting me to do this, and I hope everybody enjoyed that. And I'm really keen to, to have him, you know, take any questions if you have them.